part between Israel and uh, England. I think he's probably, I guess, on the average to be in Italy by about now. But he's uh, representing, he said, a number of events in, in Europe that will be culminating with an event actually uh, in, uh, next week in, in London, uh, which is the release of the first uh, working paper in the Nisa series that the first was started, you know, from many times. Uh, authored on Cosmo Pop and the questions on anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Anyway, uh, my name is Ed Kaplan. I'm on the advisory board here at Lisa. I'm a, a professor at the uh, Manhattan School of Delft. And I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Professor Mark Gelber from Ben Gurion University of Beersheba, Israel. And um, Mark is a, an expert in uh, all aspects, many aspects, I should say, of, of literary criticism. It's actually a particular pleasure to welcome him back to Yale because his PhD was from this university in 1980 in the German department. Uh, he has uh, either authored or edited a number of books, including books with titles like Kafka, Zionism, and Beyond, uh, Confrontations, Accommodations, German Jewish Literary and Cultural History, from Heine to Wasserman, and Melancholy Pride, Nation, Race, and Gender in the German Literature of Cultural Zionism. Uh, literary antisemitism is one of several research areas of Professor Galbers. Today he's going to be speaking with us about literary anti-Semitism revisited, Paul Demand and Mel Gibson. So with no further ado, Professor Galbers. <coughs> Thanks very much for the introduction, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to uh, read this talk and uh, show some of uh, some, a sequence from uh, Mel Gibson's Passion, Passion of Christ. I don't know if you've seen that. And uh, uh, it's lucky if you haven't, but it is if you have, then I hope you'll bear with, with seeing it again, at least that sequence. First, three short comments. As a Yale alumnus myself and as a student of Paul DeMond, I hope that I would be able to give this talk in the upstairs lecture hall at the Whitney Humanities Center so that I might stand next to or opposite the picture of DeMond, who once served as director of the Whitney Center, and as such may be considered one of its guiding spirits. In any case, I have come neither to honor nor to bury him. <laughs> number two, Paul Rose an expert on Richard Wagner and anti-Semitism, who teaches, I believe, at Penn State University, wrote that, quote, more than any other subject, lecturing on anti-Semitism requires an assessment of the audience being addressed, unquote. This supposition may have something to do with Rose's concern for what he called the emotional environment of anti-Semitism, with the fact that for him, quote, anti-Semitism is a mentality an amalgam of emotion, sensibility, ideology, and formal concepts." Unquote. The following remarks which should be designed to take this particular Yale audience into account are part of a larger study I am currently working on about comparative literary anti-Semitism. But frankly, the question of this audience is a mystery to me. It's not, simply, it's not a simple matter to gauge in advance a, a Yale audience and my topic includes the case of Paul DeMann, who taught here, for, taught here for the last dozen or so years of his career, especially in terms of its possible relationship to him as one of Yale's own, one of its very distinguished and very controversial own. Three, the word comparative in the title of my project does not refer to a comparison between Paul DeMann and Mel Gibson. <laughs> Although I did, I admit that I did wonder if perhaps Gibson was a graduate of the Yale Drama School, <laughs> or, or if he taught there once. I tended to doubt it, but if it were true, the possibilities for comparison between the two might become much more intriguing, but perhaps not, as we shall soon see. Before presenting my thesis on Paul DeMann and Mel Gibson and comparative literary anti-Semitism, I would like to begin by commenting on terminology and the recent history of the study of literary anti-Semitism. <coughs> that is, on literary anti-Semitism as a field of inquiry. In order to do so, I need to foreground myself briefly in the discussion, as I have already done so, done to some degree. The term literary anti-Semitism is not really well known. And therefore, it is only rarely used in scholarly or other discussions. 
even in research on anti-Semitism. Over 25 years ago, <coughs> I suggested a definition of literary anti-Semitism. <coughs> the capacity or potential of a text to encourage or positively evaluate anti-Semitic attitudes and behavior. This definition has occasionally been adopted by other scholars, although it was only rarely employed as a concept, as far as I know, in the extended debate about Paul DeMond, <coughs> beginning in 1987, after the discovery of his controversial wartime journalism in collaborationist newspapers in Belgium. Over the last decades, I have felt partially responsible for the situation. I completed my doctoral dissertation under the direction of Jeffrey Sammons at Yale in 1980 on aspects of literary anti-Semitism in English and German literature. A separate chapter was devoted to the concept itself. Another chapter presented a methodology for investigating literary anti-Semitism. And another one was devoted to pedagogical guidelines for teaching literary anti-Semitism. Two chapters focused on specific examples one from English, Dickens, and one from German, Freitag, literary history. Also, I somehow managed to fit in a concise history of literary anti-Semitism, going back to pre-Christian examples. The reason I blame myself for the widespread ignorance about this concept and a perhaps regrettable failure to utilize the terminology is that I decided in the early 1980s not to publish my dissertation as a book. Had I done so, it might have allowed for more extensive dissemination of the concept itself. I did publish revised excerpts from the dissertation. In fact, I was fortunate enough as a graduate student to publish a kind of blueprint of part of the doctoral thesis before I completed it. Also, my essay, What is Literary Antisemitism? Modeled to agree on Kant's Was ist Aufklärung? What is Enlightenment? appeared in Jewish Social Studies, a well-known Jewish studies journal. That essay was read by a few American scholars interested in Jewish studies, judging from several subsequent references to it and to the concept literary anti-Semitism. I also published short studies separately in German and in English on Thomas Mann and literary anti-Semitism, Gustav Freitag and literary anti-Semitism, T.S. Eliot and literary anti-Semitism, and perhaps a few others. But these studies were received by limited readerships because they were printed either in scholarly journals or in relatively remote scholarly collections. Perhaps I am also to blame because I never organized any kind of, ac of academic or professional meeting regarding literary anti-Semitism, which might have given it additional exposure. Without dwelling on this topic too long, probably I have dwelt on it too long, I would like to add that the first academic conference devoted entirely to literary anti-Semitism took place only one year ago at the Center for Interdisciplinary Research at the University of Bielefeld in Germany. At the conference and in the published proceedings, my doctoral dissertation was cited as a pioneering study in the field because it appeared so many years before interest in literary anti-Semitism that is, has reached the, I would say, the academic world in, this, in the particular form that I'm discussing it. But even in most of the papers delivered at Bielefeld, the concept of literary anti-Semitism was not presented as a stable one, or it was not uniformly mediated. Most of the lecturers at the conference had no idea that there is a term and a history to the term literary anti-Semitism. Attention given to aspects of comparative literary anti-Semitism appears to me to represent a new scholarly development, and the, par the, paramet the parameters of its concerns have not been drawn definitely as yet. In my earlier work on literary anti-Semitism, I expressed interest in studies which claimed, for example, that literary anti-Semitism was more important in one given country, France comes to mind, relative to some other countries, and in contradistinction to other forms of anti-Semitism prevalent in that same country, economic anti-Semitism, racial anti-Semitism, political anti-Semitism, for example, in terms of assessing the general character and intensity of anti-Semitism within and across national boundaries. Over the years, I've been most interested in literary anti-Semitism in Germany or in German language texts before and after the Shoah. And it is fair to say that recent impulses from Germany have begun to dominate in the field. 
One reason for this development may be the continued production of literary or dramatic works in German which have been called examples of literary anti-Semitism. And sometimes these works have been authored by major or relatively important German writers and playwrights. In this context, one may cite Thomas Mann, Fassbinder, Gerhard Sperenz, and Martin Walzer. Another reason may be the relatively major and relatively minor public and political anti-Semitic incidents in Germany, which repeatedly come into view. Sometimes, but not always, there is an echo or some fallout regarding these incidents abroad and beyond Europe. Also, if it, if it could be, also it could be that Germany is considered by many to be a separate case in this regard because of the Shoah. And recurrent cultural anti-Semitism is of special interest given the vast human <coughs> tragedy which emanated from Nazi Germany in the past. One last point before turning to Demon and, Gip and Gibson. It concerns my own misgivings and critical reading of a part of my earlier work on literary anti-Semitism. About 20, some 25 years ago, I emphasized that in order to measure literary anti-Semitism, one had to read and analyze texts closely in order to understand how anti-Semitically charged literary elements contribute to a text's anti-Semitic potential. According to my original conception, most of the critical and close reading involved in understanding literary anti-Semitism was text-oriented, rather than, say, reader or reader-response oriented. How readers received this potential at the time of, of publication, if there was one, or how different readerships over time received it, appeared to me to be important components in the study of literary anti-Semitism, but not the main part of the enterprise. What I now think is that the reception aspect is much more important and as an object of inquiry, at least as important as the anti-Semitic potential of the text. The possibly subjectivist aspect of reader response does not trouble me as much anymore as it once did. Thus, my current work in this field has become more reader response oriented. I would like to add that at the same time, I have not felt it necessary to revise my approach vis-a-vis -vis the author what was called then the anti-Semite author. At that time, I favored, as I do now, the marginalization or exclusion of the author, despite the fact that the author, once pronounced dead by Roland Barthes in a famous essay, seems to be making a comeback or undergoing a process of resuscitation in general. Regarding liter literary anti-Semitism, the question of whether or not the author should be labeled an anti-Semite, should one label an author of a text, an anti-Semite or not, is irrelevant to the challenge of comprehending literary and cultural anti-Semitism according to the way I understand the concept. As you will see, I do not care at all about Paul DeMann or about Mel Gibson, about whether or not it is fair to label them anti-Semites, just as I did not care some 25 years ago whether Chaucer, Shakespeare, Dickens, Gustav Freitag, T.S. Eliot, Thomas Mann, Hemingway, or other major or minor writers could be fairly categorized in this way. What does concern me is literature or text, discourses, here films, that have the capacity to stimulate anti-Semitic behaviors or encourage anti-Semitic attitudes or to evaluate them positively as readers, viewers, receptors encounter them. I am also interested in improbable responses and flabbergasting reception histories, private and public controversies, and scandals which ensue in light of heated dis disagreements regarding literary anti-Semitism. This is a vital aspect and it represents one link between DeMond's wartime journalism and Gibson's The Passion of Christ. When I spoke about audiences before, only part of my dilemma concerns the extent to which a Yale audience today is familiar with the case of DeMann, and perhaps defensive about him or possessive at all, some 25 years after his death, and about 20 years after the revelations of his printed journalism, <coughs> some 200 short pieces in collaborationist newspapers during the Nazi occupation of Belgium in the 1940s. Perhaps it will suffice to state that Paul de Man, until his death in 1983, was one of the most celebrated professors of comparative literature in the United States, at a time when Yale University 
was probably the most prestigious university for the study of literature in this country and perhaps in the world. Whether or not he continues to maintain this status today, I cannot judge. It, he was one of the towering pillars of what came to be known subsequently as the Yale School, or the Yale School of Literary Criticism. I think it is fair to say that among his following and many doctoral students could be found some of the most brilliant literature students of that generation, many of whom today occupy important positions and chair professorships at leading institutions in the US and perhaps worldwide. The man, I think, more than the others in the Yale School, what was called the Yale School, Harold Bloom, Jeffrey Hartman, J. Hillis Miller, came to be classified under the rubric of deconstruction, partially because of his close association with Jacques Derrida, who in the 1970s and early 80s was teaching regularly as a guest professor at Yale. The intellectual relationship between Derrida and the man is quite complex. <coughs> Jeffrey Hartman has recently com commented about its obtuseness. Not his word. He uses the word oblique. In his recollections entitled A Scholar's Tale. Although there may be some common tendencies, although there may be some common tendencies or overlappings in the work of the two, I always viewed them and their approaches to text as fairly distinct. What interested Demont chiefly was the rhetoricity of a text, mostly the gap between literal and figural rhetorical meanings, and how readers were fundamentally at a loss to choose between one or the other. Once in class, as I recall, he even cited a remark made by Archie Bunker, who in the 1970s was a well-known television character in order, perhaps, to emphasize the universality of his insight, that it was impossible to choose to decide between literal or, figure, or figurative meaning. At that time, I had no idea who Archie Bunker was. <laughs> to, put it ter to put it tersely, the basic problem, as far as demand specified it, was with language itself and its indeterminacy. And this presented an entire inventory of problems for readers of text and for, liter and for literary criticism. Of course, it became much more complex than that. The discovery shortly after his death of previously unknown collaborationist journalism by the young Paul Deman sent shockwaves in many directions, and the shock may have been more intense than might have been anticipated since his colleagues, students, and friends had been busy commemorating his career and lauding him and his achievements immediately following his death in 1983. One of DeMond's colleagues, J. Hillis Miller, had just used the occasion of his own presidential address to the Modern Language Association of America to celebrate the triumph of theory to which DeMond contributed in no small measure in the United States very shortly before that same critical edifice of theory was about to fall precipitously to its partial ruin. One short essay by DeMond Les Juifs dans la littérature actuelle, The Jews in Contemporary, in Contemporary Literature, published in Le Soir on March 4, 1941, stands out from the rest, and it may be considered as an example of literary anti-Semitism. Even the staunchest of Demand's defenders, his friend Jacques Derrida, called this essay unbearable and disastrous. Jeffrey Hartman wrote at the time of the revelations in March 1988 that the man's formulations, quote, show all the marks and the dangerous implications of identifying Jews as an alien and unhealthy presence in Western civilization, unquote. Basically, DeMond described, and here I paraphrase, a negative Jewish influence on literature and Jewish writers hiding behind Latinized pseudonyms who orchestrates secretly a nefarious plan to corrupt European literature. In fact, Jews are insidiously complicit in spreading false notions about themselves and their role in European literature and culture. Demand condemned Jewish cultural contributions as foreign, unhealthy, overly ethereal and cold, and characterized by exaggerated wittiness. Demand claimed that Jews were never truly creative and that Jewish artists were always second-rate. 
It was possible only owing to the disorder characteristic of the false European existence after the First World War for the Jews to play a major but negative role in cultural life. Vulgar anti-Semitism called this existence one of decline or decadent because it was, it was enjuivé, that is, permeated with Jewishness. But fortunately, according to Demand's view, true European intellectuals and European culture in general were able to defend themselves against Jewish interference and remain fundamentally healthy. A practical solution of the Jewish question would be the establishment of an isolated Jewish colony far removed from Europe and the removal of the European Jews to it. Western literature would stand to lose very little of value, maybe only a few personalities of mediocre worth, if such a colony were to come into existence. These components, individually and in some, are the undeniable markers of literary antisemitism. In the academic and public controversy that ensued, some observers, including some prominent ones, like Frank Latricia, Jacob Neusner, Neusner called the man a disreputable and disgusting Nazi, a vicious anti-Semite and Nazi collaborator. And Jeffrey Mailman seized this opportunity to denounce and attack not only demand but also deconstruction, and also to link deconstruction with Nazism in an attempt, perhaps, to marginalize deconstruction permanently or to consign it to oblivion, owing to this scandalous association. Interestingly, the defenders of demand, many of them as colleagues and students, normally included some criticism or partial reservations regarding his early journalism as part of the defense. I was living in Israel at the time, but I understood this feature to be mostly a calculated tactic rather than a sincere rejection, which in fact served the greater goal of exculpating Demand overall and acquitting him posthumously. In general, these same defenders of Demand, steeped in the same or a related variety of reading practice as he was, argued in favor of admitting the rhetorical complexity of the early journalism and thereby relativizing its objectionable nature, employing the same kind of subtle but complex reading strategy, strategies associated with demand, especially the exposure of the indeterminate meaning of certain terms and figures, some of demand's defenders were able to suggest salvageable or usable aspects of his exposition rather than reject, rejecting the collaborationist journalism peremptorily. By questioning some problematical expressions found in the essay, the, the degree to which Demand deviated from the collaborationist or Nazi line could be intimated, or even in some cases determined in his favor. In some of the writings in this vein, Demand's Les Juifs, this essay, begins to appear to be more like an essay which might have appeared in an underground pamphlet distributed by the resistance against Nazism than a piece published in a collaborationist newspaper. And um, the, the problem of contextualizing reading in general is one that needs to be taken into account. As far as I'm concerned, we'll see to a degree to what extent it is taken into account. I could cite several examples, but for reasons of time, I will only mention one. Tim Botti, one of DeMond's outstanding doctoral students, perhaps some of you know him or knew him, and today a professor of comparative literature at the University of Michigan, as far as I know. I didn't look up the last time I did. He relativized the literary anti-Semitism of Le Juif by ingeni ingeniously contextualizing it, in fact, as a scarcely disguised reading of another essay written by Demand himself previously. It was, in fact, for body a self-critical response on the part of Demand to an earlier piece of his on the contemporary English novel. Body argued that Le Juif, the essay, has less to do with the issue of the Jews than with, the read than with reading Western literature in general. And it was in this inner literary sense, quote, the reversal of one text into another, unquote. Without citing any specific evidence, Body concluded as follows, I quote, Demand was not a Nazi, not a fascist, 
even if he was able to write and sign a piece of literary anti-Semitism and erring reading. But even one article by demand that may be anti-Semitic and simultaneously may not be anti-Semitic is worth remembering. By the way, body is one of the, maybe the only reference to this term, literary anti-Semitism, because I knew him and I could have seen him in my work at the time. Body's reading, which is informed by demand's own rhetorical reading process, allows him to exculpate his teacher by minimalizing or neutralizing the objectionable anti-Semitic potential of the article. This type of apologia while consistent with Demand's reading practice, or with deconstructionist readings in general, is suspect because it seeks to problematize, in a radical way, a fairly straightforward example of literary anti-Semitism, journalistic literary anti-Semitism, which, given its publication context and the history of literary anti-Semitism, was almost certainly received as literary anti-Semitism by its historical readership. We cannot know this for sure, but at least there is no evidence I have seen in the reception to the effect that Demand was considered to be a subtle but incisive critic of Nazi or collaborationist cultural politics on the basis of this essay or of others. Demand himself never broached the topic of his early anti-Semitic essay, although along the lines of these apologist readings, he could have chosen to defend himself in the same way. Those who argue that owing to its various indeterminacies, Le Juif may just as easily be read as literary anti-Semitism or as anti-literary anti-Semitism. Bodies, what Tim Body wrote, may be anti-Semitic, may be not anti-Semitic, <coughs> are, in my opinion, seriously misguided. It is simply not true, and one needs to be able to say it and also to question seriously the motives and reading practice or reading practices of those who would defend this position. As a matter of fact, it takes a good amount of concerted effort that goes against the very grain of the language of the article to advance such a claim. Even if it is possible to isolate some ambiguous expressions or problematical references in the article, which may be partially attributable to the very nature of language itself, the capacity of the text to formulate and communicate, communicate clearly an anti-Semitic potential to my, is, to my mind, indisputable. Since the issue of demand as anti-Semite author is not at all pertinent to literary anti-Semitism, as far as I understand it, there is no need to adduce <coughs> evidence one way or the other regarding his activities or friendships or other writings. While there are some discrepancies and unexpected judgments in Demand's essay, which may give one pause, since they do not quite match the profile of a collaborationist article, there may be better ways of explaining them. For example, in Le Juif, Demand lists Franz Kafka, along with G, Hemingway, and Lawrence, as authors who exhibit in their writing a positive effort to penetrate the interior life as continuators of a particular European tradition. Some commentators have cited this example to suggest that Demann, by including a Jewish writer, Kafka, with the others, was in fact protesting subtly the exclusionary cultural politics of Nazism. In my opinion, it is much more likely that in 1941 he was simply unaware of Kafka's Jewish background as many readers today continue to be ignorant about it. If one, for example, would read The Metamorphosis, perhaps his best known work at that time, and I think today as well, um, or The Trial, the, 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 um, the explicit literary references are Christian, they're not Jewish. And so therefore, a reader who did not um, engage in biographical uh, criticism or some kind of positivistic criticism at that particular point would, would not think certainly on the basis of reading those texts, that Kafka was a, a, Jew, was a Jewish writer. The attempt to, to employ the demand case in an effort to discredit deconstruction in general has been rejected by many of demand's defenders. Jeffrey Hartman, for example, wrote in retrospect that since the enemies of deconstruction were unable to defeat it intellectually, 
they used the Holocaust against it. I quote, deconstruction was condemned as somehow the extension of a fascist mindset, unquote. My view is that the many attempts to defend or exculpate demand by employing theory and rhetorical or deconstructionist readings of his wartime journalism, which relativize and marginalize his literary anti-Semitism, set a process in motion which led in a short time to the end of the hegemony of deconstruction in American literary scholarship. In my opinion, it is not that the Holocaust was used against it in Hartman's sense. Rather, the Nazis and their allies have normally played the role of the very incarnation of evil to an overwhelming majority of American observers. The issues of Nazism and the Holocaust are, la are largely black and white for Americans. <coughs> Accordingly, they do not require or suffer subtle gray discriminations. Thus, the very attempt to salvage demand, rhetorical reading, and deconstruction by means of overly sophisticated gray readings of his early journalism, maybe yes, maybe no, in face of the discovery of his link to Nazi collaboration, struck a false note and was rejected by and large outside of the inner circle of the Mons loyal colleagues, friends and students, and outside of the Academy of the United States in general. At the same time, Holocaust and exile studies were propitiously well positioned to move closer to the center of American academic interest, as were new historical approaches and other varieties of readings and historical and, and cultural literary approaches, feminist, gender, post-colonial, etc. In time, Demand's rhetorical reading and deep construction were seen to be more formalist or closer to new criticism in nature than had been perceived in the 70s and 80s, and thus seemingly oblivious to or neglectful of historical contextualizations, which could now be viewed as indispensable for literary analysis. My second example, which is also partially concerned with the question of historical authenticity, is Mel Gibson's Passion of Christ. The popular American magazine Entertainment Week called it in, in 2006 the most controversial film of all time. An extended debate about its possible anti-Semitism began even before the film was officially released. And a critic as distinguished as René Girard wrote that the film could be compared with Nazi propaganda. Abraham Foxman, the national director of the Anti-Defamation League wrote, I quote, the film unambigu unambiguously portrays Jewish authorities and the Jewish mob as the ones responsible for the decision to crucify Jesus, unquote. And as such, it was a flagrant and dangerous example of what I would call filmic anti-Semitism. <laughs> the identification and condemnation of the Jews as the collective murderers of Christ is an integral aspect of Western literary anti-Semitism. Evidently, in the first year after its release, approximately 67 million Americans viewed the Passion of Christ. A truly staggering figure. Where these figures come from, I'm not sure. <laughs> Several million DVDs and video copies have been sold. Within this framework, I would like to explore to what degree literary anti-Semitism contributes to filmic anti-Semitism. It is fair to speak of literary anti-Semitism in this particular case, because the spoken languages in the film, principally Aramaic, but <coughs> also Latin, and a bit of Hebrew, are inaccessible to American film audiences with preciously few example, exceptions. Thus, the sense of the dialogue is conveyed principally and almost exclusively by means of subtitles, which film goers have to read. The decision to have the script written and performed in inaccessible languages, perhaps in order to convey a sense of historical authenticity, would in almost all cases dictate that the audience be severely limited American filmgoers are notoriously adverse to reading subtitles. Maybe that's not true in New Haven, but uh, in general, one could say it's true. Thus, only rarely can a film made in a foreign language be a popular success in the American cinema. But the fate of The Passion of Christ as a stupendous box office hit places it in a separate category, 
which needs to be accounted for, especially because the use of inaccessible languages renders Jesus and his world more foreign than a sympathetic and sympathy-engendering film would normally wish. At the same time, Jesus cannot be differentiated from his enemies easily by linguistic means, such as accent or dialect. There is no possibility of discriminating between a possibly reprehensible or defective Jewish Aramaic and non-Jewish use of the same language in order to contribute to an anti-Semitic effect. Film directors have a range of options regarding the manner in which Jewish figures may be represented on the screen, as is also the case regarding the presentation of Jews on stage. Within the framework of literary or filmic anti-Semitism, it is first of all crucial that Jewish figures who manifest negative qualities and behaviors be easily dis distinguishable as Jews within the cast of characters. Regarding Gibson's film, though, it turns out that on the basis of visual imagery, it is not always easy for viewers to classify characters as Jews or non-Jews. It is not easy sometimes or even possible for viewers to know during certain scenes if those who are tormenting and torturing Jesus are Jews or Romans or both, or none of the above. <coughs> One cannot always be certain if individual Jews or the Jews as a collective whole are responsible for his suffering. In order for the character depictions in the film to contribute tangibly to filmic anti-Semitism, this aspect must be crystal clear. Actually, in this respect, the possible filmic anti-Semitism is predicated on knowledge acquired in advance. The viewer must be convinced or claim to know before the film begins that the Jews were responsible for the suffering and crucifixion of Jesus. In order for the filmic anti-Semitism to be effective, one can also find confirmation of this aspect in the reception. Gordon Mork wrote that if one went to the film in order to see anti-Semitic stereotypes of venomous Jews, one would have no problem finding them. However, as Joseph Adelheit argued, if viewers not predisposed in this manner came to watch this same film, they might just as easily be persuaded by it that the Jews were not all evil or guilty in this matter. Furthermore, it is difficult for viewers to know whether or not Jesus himself can be identified as a Jew or as a non-Jew. This fact also mitigates the possible filmic anti-Semitism because Christian anti-Semitism is based to some extent on the rhetorical distancing of Jesus from his Judaism and from a reprehensible and corrupt Jewish religious establishment. The literary creation of a differentiated Jewish Jesus figure rooted in the complicated, fractious, but partially nurturing Jewish Hellenistic and Roman environment of the ancient Near East tends to militate against literary anti-Semitism. Perhaps the most recent example of this tendency, which has a fairly long history, is the first volume of Anne Rice, Rice's popular Jesus trilogy, Christ the Lord out of Egypt, which appeared in 2005. It is an unambiguous <coughs> celebration of the Jewish Jesus, as well as a remarkable pro-Jewish and pro-Zionist or pro-Israeli text. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it. I can't recommend it, but nevertheless, it is out there. Another factor which needs to be taken into account is the utilization of the word Jew in the subtitles of Gibson's film. Since it is normally a negative epithet in this context, as a matter of fact, the term is used only sparingly, which can be seen as another factor which tends to reduce literary and filmic anti-Semitism. When Pontius Pilate interrogates Jesus and asks whether or not he is the king of the Jews, or when Pilate rhetorically asks whether he himself is a Jew, he says, am I a Jew? The Jewish identity of Jesus is doubly or triply complicated. <coughs> in an exceptional sequence, one of the relatively positive figures in the film, Simon of Cyrene, is called Jew in a hostile manner by a Roman soldier, which triggers, by way of negation, distinctly negative feelings towards the Romans. Simon, the Jew, aids the suffering Jesus by helping him carry the oversized, burdensome cross on the Via Dolorosa. Thus, the Jew Simon, and I think here the Christian Jesus, carry the cross together. 
in pain and with great suffering. And viewers may be encouraged to interpret this sequence as, a, as an example of Jewish Christian solidarity. Probably the most important consideration regarding the literary and filmic anti-Semitism of the Passion, similar to the medieval Passionspiele, is the inclusion of the famous but problematical passage from the book of Matthew, chapter 27, line 25, in which the crowd or the people or the Jews or the mob, depending on the translation, take on the responsibility or the blame for the crucifixion of Jesus. Quote, let his blood be upon us and our children. Unquote. This statement has been cited and utilized for centuries in the arsenal of literary anti-Semitism in order to document the eternal guilt of the Jews and to justify anti-Semitism. However, the fact that this formulation does not appear in the subtitles or was deleted from the final cut reflects another attempt to mitigate the possible filmic anti-Semitism. The sequence which precedes and follows this boisterous mob scene is very, very subtly orchestrated by the director Mel Gibson. Synchronic interruption, the intercalation of flashbacks, Pilate twice washing his hands as a sign of his innocence, which he also proclaims out loud, the soothing retrospective parallel scene where Jesus washes his hands before breaking bread in the presence of his loyal disciples, and other cinematographic features tend to reduce the possible filmic anti-Semitism by diverting attention from the increasing frenzy and threatening unruliness of the crowd scene. The chaotic situation presented by the threatening mob, as well as the loud and harsh noises of the soundtrack and the rapid tempo of changing angles and focus, overwhelm and drown out the spoken words which emanate from the crowd, the same words which, if communicated clearly by subtitles, would no doubt serve to increase or intensify the filmic anti-Semitism. But viewers normally have no sense that the crowd is uttering the famous defamatory line from Matthew. I had to watch and listen to this sequence carefully many times before I was able to convince myself that these words were, in fact, being said by a voice in the mob although there were no concomitant subtitles which convey them clearly to the audience. This fact provides conclusive evidence of the attempt to mitigate the possible filmic anti-Semitism of the Passion. And I want to show this, I want to show this sequence for those of you who don't know it. Um, again, what I've been doing here is, is showing over and over again the different ways in which the film, the different kinds of elements of the film, reduce the possible filmic anti-Semitism of the Passion, despite the fact that it was received very, very loudly as an example of anti-Semitism. So we're going to uh, shut the lights off, maybe, and see if we can do this, all right? Was this shut off while oh, I wasn't here? No. Ah, 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 
ng baldek min hazui. Ula kada, pune kia rea. I don't know what happened to the place we had. While we're waiting for this, I can just ask one question. Yeah. My understanding is that the offensive passage was only removed from, from the uh, subtitles after a, uh, a stink was raised, basically. So yeah. It's not exactly as if there was an attempt to be considered from the start here on kids in school. Yeah. That's absolutely true. The anti diff but maybe we'll just finish. I have maybe one more paragraph and one more page, and we'll, we'll come to an end of it. Okay, go ahead. Very sorry that uh, we couldn't see that, even though it was set up before. I don't know what happened to it. With the scene again, one more time. We saw the, that crowd scene. So you have the crowd and the noise, the noise of the crowd, and the, the uh, you have a voice saying, "Crucify him." And that is that is quite distinct. And it's also you see the subtitle. Hear it in Aramaic. For those who understand Aramaic, it's quite clear. You hear, you hear uh, different uh, versions of the word that, that is the word for cross or to crucify. That that is in different Aramaic formations, and from the crowd. But what you what you don't ever see is this: "May His blood be on us and on our children." But if you go over it many many times and listen, that you can make out the word for blood in Aramaic. And you can make out the word, uh, uh, it sounds similar to aleinu, may his blood be on us. You know, the mo aleinu, something like this. Dam shalo aleinu. So you, you, you hear the Aramaic of that, but it's impossible to make out because of the noise and the shifting scenes from the crowd, and also because there are no subtitles to that effect. And that was my point. I thought it would be nice to show it to you. Sorry. <laughs> Taking the examples of Damon and Gibson together, it is possible to argue that despite the numerous features and devices which tend to increase 
and intensified literary anti-Semitism, as in the case of Daman, and those which should reduce the literary or filmic anti-Semitism, as in the case of Gibson's passion, readers and observers and audiences with their own predispositions, agendas, and reading practices regularly impose their readings on text, which in a sense partially allow them to do so, or at least they are vulnerable and ultimately defenseless to a degree against these kinds of receptions. That is why the question of literary anti-Semitism needs to take reception and reader response more prominently into account, and to investigate carefully the possible reasons for strong individual readings. Consequently, it is possible to appreciate the usefulness, if not validity, of some of the subjectivist reader response tenets of an observer like Norman Holland, who argues that it is readers and audiences which shape texts rather than the other way around. Furthermore, it is not sufficient to reject defenses of the Mansleyan weave solely on the basis of dismissing them as apologies written by friends who knew him personally or who may testify that he was not an anti-Semite. Rather, claims for the truth of the basic rhetorical indeterminacy of language on one hand versus claims for the capacity of language to communicate, to communicate relatively efficiently on the other need to be seen in an historical reception context. Thus, it may be that if Mel Gibson's passion was received and condemned as much more anti-Semitic than it in fact should have been in accordance with the several features which tend to mitigate its potential <coughs> filmic anti-Semitism, it may be attributable to an unwillingness on the part of Americans to countenance at this point in time even a minor degree of cultural anti-Semitism after the Shoah. The very different and lukewarm reception of the passion in Germany and Austria, which had preciously little to do with anti-Semitism, tends to corroborate this type of explanation. The same may be said regarding the case of Demand, even though the audience is a much more limited one. The various reports and studies of American anti-Semitism, which are issued annually by the Anti-Defamation League and other agencies, tend to confirm this explanation by documenting slight but consistent yearly declines in the number of anti-Semitic incidents and the reduction in intensity of anti-Semitic attitudes in the U.S. While, for example, from 2005 to 2006, the number of anti-Semitic incidents doubled worldwide. The ADL survey from November 2007 verified that anti-Semitic beliefs among Americans remain at much lower levels than those seen in the European polls. Remember, six, how many million, 100 million, 100 million of them saw this particular movie. Um, I, think, I think I will end it there, because that took a lot of time. So thank you very much for your patience. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Questions or comments? Oh, sorry. I read somewhere that some of the writings of the man directly led to the death of some Jews. I don't, I can't remember where I read it, but it sticks in my mind. I don't know anything about it, uh, so I can't, I can't comment on it. I can't understand how that could be possible. Um, Jeffrey Hartman did write that the writings of Demon were irresponsible to the, in the sense that they could encourage Nazi and anti, that is, like fascist activity. So if, if you mean it, in, in that, that could be interpreted in that particular direction. But I never heard such a thing, and I think it probably is false. You should check the source of it. Yes. Uh, I, I want to make a couple of comments about this because I was very much involved in the and, and, and as an observer in the, in the, in the matter at the time when this, uh, when this broke, um, I have to say that I was very disappointed uh, with the way in which uh, uh, my own colleagues dealt uh, with this matter. And uh, uh, I was interested to hear you say that the, the exculpating demand by the application of deconstructive readings to his essays was counterproductive, which was a feeling uh, uh, in fact, I had a feeling of comedy at the time about it. I thought this was, uh, you know, just plumb ridiculous. 
Um, but there were, uh, there were two aspects of it that really bothered me. And it seemed to me that there were two things that Comparatus might have done in a situation like that. One of them would have been to pay some attention to what the man was writing about. Uh, I, there was a time when I thought that I was the only one who read all of this stuff in French and also in Flemish. Uh, uh, I, I think I probably was not the only one, finally, because you know, these, these volumes came out. But uh, there's a long list of authors that are treated in this, what, what, these are essentially book reviews, it's essentially a book reviewing project. Uh, many of these authors are, are, are not known to us uh, anymore. I don't think we associate very much with the only German author's name who I, who I uh, 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 recognized in the whole thing was Ernst Wiechert. But there was a kind of a tendency, a kind of a clear tendency to what we would think of as sort of the, 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 the right wing of the literary world at that time which he was talking about. Now there is an essay on the on the French writers and on the Francophone Belgian writers, but I have yet to see anybody actually inquire about the German writers that he was talking about or the Flemish writers. I thought this was one thing Comparatus could do. The other thing that Comparatus could do would be to put it in a con context of the intellectual anti-Semitism in the literary intellectual world internationally at the time, and perhaps make an argument that the 21-year-old Paul Zeman is trying to find uh, is trying to find an entrance into this uh, elite uh, intellectual and literary world uh, to which much of the tone of the writing seems to be attuned. Nobody talked about things like this. And they did do what you said they shouldn't do, was to debate the question of whether Paul Demand was an anti-Semitic uh, uh, writer or thinker. And that was, it, that seemed to me, to, I also had the feeling that this was irrelevant to the kind of inquiry that ought to have been made about what yeah. was going on here. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks for saying that. I, I think additionally there was a, uh, there, there were some, you know, there was always this token kind of gesture, but uh, not always, but I mean, several of the, uh, of the S's. I'm thinking also that J. Lewis Miller said, you know, DeMond must take responsibility for what he wrote. But, you know, he was, yeah. Yeah, but what does it mean exactly? Well, he, was he was already dead. Yeah, he was already dead for two years, and this and that. Rather than say, we who follow in Demand's footsteps must take responsibility. Yeah. I mean, this was that's what bothered me at that particular time. Um, it's, it was unfortunate. Um, I was wondering about uh, the way in which you define uh, literary anti-Semitism. And uh, whether there is, um, in your opinion, a reason to differentiate uh, when we think about literary production, perhaps cultural production, um, is there a way in which to differentiate between what you call journalistic um, anti-Semitism and something else which might be academic work, scholarly work, and anything else that might have some other poetic or aesthetic value. Might not have, but I mean Yeah. Well you know the, the it's a it's an important um, it's an important qu question and I'm not sure I've come to the bottom of it, to tell you the truth because I'm very as I said I'm very much interested in the problem of contextualization. That is which of, in the, the school of uh, that is theory and deconstruction is usually not interested in that. So therefore because therefore when one says well Hold them on, publish this in this particular context and at this particular time, and the readership was such and such. And such. These are different kinds of sociological and historical questions which inform the historical, empirical reading process, which, again, Demand was not interested in, and that is, and the construction is not interested in. Okay, you know, they don't have, it doesn't have to be interested in, it can be interested in what it wants to be interested in. But nevertheless, one, taking the question into account, therefore, um, if you have uh, the pro the problem is the problem of, of textuality. So that is, as long as you have textuality, whether it is in a journalistic context or in the scholarly context or in the context of poetry or fiction, that is, it seems to me that textuality is the fundamental is the fund is the fundamental principle there. And beyond that, one can take from a historical sociological perspective the different contextualizations. But it's really it's really an issue of, of um, the fundamental issue of, of language. You know, there, a lot some something has been written about 
this problem. There's a, a person named Martin Goopser who um, identified six indicators of literary anti-Semitism. I think it's it's programmatic and difficult and doesn't work so well. But nevertheless, there have been some kinds of attempts to um, sort of uh, classify clearly what categories pertain to literary anti-Semitism in, anti in order to designate a text. But what the most interesting cases are those which, as a matter of fact, make it difficult for you to categorize or classify. It's not, it's not, it's not difficult to look at uh, Mein Kampf and know what it is. <laughs> you know, even though a deconstruction, a rhetorical reading of Mein Kampf will do the same thing. So it turns out that it will, it will be maybe yes, maybe not, because that's that's the way that it goes there. And if there are certain indeterminacies of language what will make it impossible to decide the text and what comp will deconstruct itself anyway. So that that's that's that particular way of looking at things. But um, yeah. The more interesting examples are examples where you have even, I mean, the Kitman, as I said, the reference to Kafka, I believe, is an error on this part. But um, I think it's better, an easier, better, and it's a better explanation. But um, there are many writers who will combine different literary elements which are kind of sympathetic to the Jews, or uh, that is, they're not necessarily to be seen as anti Semitic, with other features that are anti Semitic. And then what does one do? For what does Goopser do? He, he can't do much there. But I mean, the concept that that I was working on in um, the late 70s and 80s was one called, which I called counterbalancing. And it was doing a kind of a, a type, uh, walking on a tightrope between these two different kinds of things. And there you don't have to categorize one or the other, but you can look into the reception again. You look at the reception and say, the re these audiences picked up Certain audiences picked up on the anti-Semitic elements, but other audiences didn't. Other, other audiences picked up on those aspects which presented a more or less favorable, favorable view of the Jews negotiating their way through European society or American society or whatever, any way you wanted it. So those seem to me to be much more complex and interesting as examples. The journalism normally is, I mean, that's what's so problematical about you know, deconstructionist readings or rhetorical readings of newspaper articles. Okay, you know, it's language, no doubt about it. But, and it, therefore it's subject to the same kind of scrutiny. And that was one of the major points that DeMond was making, that literary language was not privileged in any way. And that's why he liked Archie Bunker. Yes? So if you're talking about the how the context is important. Um, let me throw you a ball. Um, how about if the writer is Jewish? Uh, we are running here into uh, you know, questions of uh, what is an objective guideline to actually suggest if uh, this is some kind of a uh, thing that Jews can uh, say or do because, you know, it's like self criticism or is it already falling under the you know, title of anti yeah. But as I, as I said before, the project of literary anti-Semitism is not interested in the identity of the author. So, it made it easy for myself. In other words, it doesn't matter how you or Daman or, or anybody else tries to understand the Jewish or non-Jewish identity of a writer. It wouldn't mean anything. I mean, so a text by Philip Roth, for instance, when I was working on this, Philip Roth was the was the major American example. Whether Portnoy's complaint was it literary anti-Semitism or not literary anti-Semitism, <laughs> and in the reception, as one could read, there was a, this was a very controversial work at the time, and he was a Jewish, he was a patently, obviously, a publicly Jewish writer. Uh, so we we had the case. Am I answering you, or...? So in other, in other, in other words, there are Jewish I, anti semites In your view... Yeah, as I said, I'm not interested, I'm not working on the people, I'm just working on the text. Mm -hmm. But that oh. is, a Jewish person, a person whom you might define as a Jew, 
that is, it certainly could author a text which is an example of literary anti-Semitism. Absolutely. And has been done. You know, has been received that way. Yes. Yeah, I understand the distinction that you make in, in between the author or the writer being an anti Semite versus the potential of anti Semitism within the text itself. Should does that mean that the writer has some responsibility to take this into account in the process of the writing? Or is I mean were I mean, we can talk about, okay, this is where it's located, but who is the one who should bear some responsibility? Yes. Clearly not after somebody's death, but in the process yes. of creation to really be responsible for those who receive yeah. the... I think it's a very interesting question. It's a little bit beyond the purview of my work, but of course I have thought about it and it comes up quite a bit. There's a, there's a wonderful case regarding an early text by Thomas Mann, Veilzum in Blut, The Blood of the Walzums. I don't know if you know it, but it, is, it usually is included in the vintage uh, English translation volume of I think Death in Venice and Other Stories by Thomas Mann. So that is why I do not know, but it is in there if you would like to look at it in a, in a translation. In any case, this text by Thomas Mann has been called an example of literary anti-Semitism. And like the case of Mel Gibson's Passion, when it was in press, there was a a commotion. People had heard that Thomas Mann had written a potentially anti-Semitic story that compromised his wife's family, which was a, 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 the Pringsheim family, a well-known family with a Jewish background in Munich. And therefore, uh, a lot of pressure was put on Thomas Mann from within the family and from other sources to, uh, to make sure that that story was never published. And then it was not published at the Neue Rundschau in a very in a literary magazine um, at that particular time. It was later to a pirated version. It's a very interesting and complicated reception story. But what Thomas Mann wrote to his brother Heinrich at the time was, I looked at the story. He said, no, I'm, good. I'm an artist and I can write what I like. I have the freedom to write whatever I like. But I looked at the story in all of its innocence and I realized, so he wrote, that it really couldn't answer the objections <laughs> that were being made to it. So in this sense, that is, the question of responsibility, or Sandra Gilman might put it, that reception was already part of the writer's game. Right? So you're, you're probably right, but writers on the other hand cannot really be responsible for the flabbergasting kinds of readings that take place of their works. So, um, it is a complicated question. It's not so straightforward as one might think. Are you here? I'd like to pick up on that last point, but before I do, uh, I just had a question, I guess, about the larger the, the larger goals of the research in this area. It, it sounds, from the way you're describing it, that it's largely an exercise, and I don't mean this in a pejorative way, that it's largely an exercise in classification. Is a work literary anti-Semitic? Is it not? If so, what are the distinguishing features? What, you know, what, what are the arguments one can make one way or the other? But it seems that at the end of the day, you have something which is a yes, no, or a maybe. And the question is, where does one go from there, if one goes from there? Or is really the issue more one of essentially trying to categorize the literature and, and, and ask, ask this question of many, many uh, well-known works or, or new works as they come up, such as this film. So that, that was the question that I actually had in mind before this last one. Because what you just said, that you know anyone can do whatever they want with a piece of work, this is, this is a little bit troubling. David Hirsch, who has been a visitor here many times, often makes the following argument, which is that someone who is, for example, very, very critical of Israel that tries to go out of their way, sometimes not to be anti-Semitic, or doesn't say so, or doesn't say anti-Semitic things explicitly, nonetheless gives license for people who are, in fact, anti-Semitic to take that work and use it, and use it in a way which ultimately proves harmful, and harmful to Jews, which can lead them to real acts of anti-Semitism, real violence, and so on. And, it, and he would argue that, in fact, people who are writing in this realm do have a responsibility to try and immunize as much as possible what they write against those anti-Semitic interpretations. Um, I, I suppose the, the shining case in point these days is that book by Mershana and Walt, which has been picked up by everybody in the sun. You know, we can have our own arguments about whether or not they individually are anti-Semitic or not, but, but that their work itself certainly reeks 
of uh, pretty standard anti-Semitic canards, and that it's been used by well-known anti-Semites to sort of uh, butt the stolen arguments, I think is clear. So I'm a little worried about this This sort of, well, you know, any, anybody can use what anyone writes. And, and people know that that's how it can be used. Uh, so they can be pretty Hang on, two different questions. Here. Yeah. Should I respond? Yeah, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I would say that is, about 25 years ago, I thought that um, I was very much interested when you said, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. In the question of pedagogy. Let us say, we are, if we are teaching, we are putting curric curricula together in the schools, or we're teaching at the universities, which text should we choose to teach? And why? And should literary anti-Semitism be a, a criterion for inclusion in curricula? And so, therefore, in other words, I, I, I think uh, Shakespeare's not a bad writer, or Chaucer should be included, or Dickens, or this and that. So does it make sense to, to teach, is Oliver Twist the right choice for me? Or is our mutual friend the right choice for me? Or is Bleak, which one? In other words, is this factor, that is a factor that's worth considering in that particular context? And in those years, I was naive enough, I think, to believe that one could really learn a lot about literature by including works and I made arguments to include these works, to, to make a point of teaching uh, the Priorist's tale rather than, you know, the Partner's tale, or rather teach uh, the Merchant of Venice rather than, you know, something else, or te teach uh, the Jew of Malta. It doesn't matter, that is whatever, to teach these works to, so that one would have the opportunity of confronting literary anti-Semitism and the, the entire complex of of uh, literary, but also cultural and historical and sociological problems that that naturally uh, come to the fore when one is teaching these things and in the discussions. But then I noticed that um, you know, discussing these things with colleagues very often one didn't have time for this. This was seen to be these were this is secondary or tertiary or really not the most important thing when one teaches uh, one of these texts. You know, uh, it may be there. And, the Merchant of Venice, but you know, there are more, more important things to discuss there you know, than the, 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 the Jewish issue. So um, I changed my mind about it a little bit. That, that's one way to look at it. The other thing has to do with the field, that is bringing literary anti-Semitism into the realm of anti, the research on anti-Semitism altogether. And, in, and I think in a more sophisticated way than it has been, been done up until now. I think it's a, it's, it's a complicated topic. What complicates it is the, is the problem of censorship and the right of an author to depict a, or a negative, a Jewish character <coughs> negatively. Now you say, well, what about in Hebrew literature or in Yiddish literature? In Jew this is why I go to the problem of audience and reception and the, the problem of context. Because when you read, when you are presenting Shylock in Yiddish or in Hebrew, in, in Israel or in Eastern Europe, it didn't matter. That is, there were many different aspects that could be taken into account um, that the, the historical audiences perhaps you know, uh, related in one, in one way, but um, when one takes reception history over time into account, one can see some very many interesting things taking place. And therefore, um, I, I'm very, uh, I have my doubts about uh, the kind of approach that uh, David Hirsch uses. And um, I'm, that is, I think that it's the readers and critics who have to be more responsible. I, I mean, I think that's what I've tried to say today. That is, when you look, this, these, these kinds of works appear to me, I mean, I thought that we were almost finished with them in the late 70s or days. You see, it's not the case. Oh, there are cycles, they get produced. I'm fairly certain that we'll have a bit more. And of course, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing in France and, and of course in the Islamic world, etc. So we have so much of this being produced that what we need to develop are responsible readerships, res responsible um, uh, organs that, that, dis that take responsibility for condemning it. So, uh, 
more than that, I'm not sure we can do without crossing a, a treacherous line that, regarding censorship or oppression of writers. Um, that's, that's really how I would see it. I would like to come back to uh, Martin Walser and um, Philip Roth. German intellectuals make the claim that if Philip Roth can uh, talk about or write about the shortcomings in the Jewish community, why shouldn't they? Of course, I don't say let's use Philip Roth as an example that we should look and write about the shortcomings within ourselves. And I feel, and of course anybody who does that in Germany is called Westbeschmutz or somebody who calls the own, ne uh, own nest. So I find this kind of logic, if one can call it such, totally bizarre. If I write about, let's say, my family, and there were some dubious characters, you know, second and third cousins, etc., etc., uh, I think I have a right to do that. Uh, I think I'm a little more, less hesitant to write about my neighbors, the, the, the Millers, where I divulge um, personal information with a specific point of uh, hurting them. And as a German Gentile, I am very careful uh, not to cross that line. I have read most of Philip Wolf's work and have not picked up on, on the anti-Semitism. I read him as dealing with his community mm -hmm. in, in the, the shortcomings, the, uh, all of it. And I do not see that as, as anti-Semitic because that would again confirm the notion that Jews should be better than Gentiles, which I hear very often among Gentiles because I was told in France, among Gentiles, among Gentiles uh, if, uh, if the, they should be better than us because they have suffered so much, they should know better. Okay, so <laughs> uh, it gets very uh, convoluted. I think each community has the right to not to uh, uh, vilify its own community, but to be open and honest and write about uh, what goes on for the simple reason that nobody is perfect. And see it from a strictly human point of view, but I take great issue when Germans use Philip Ford as an example. He can write all this nasty stuff about Jews, why can't we? He's very popular, of course, in German translation. Um, but this was specifically also from, from historian uh, uh, intellectuals yeah. who were at the time of the Walser um, in quote scandal, you know, who termed, uh, coined the term the Auschwitz culture and wrote that uh, book where we vilified, um, uh, what's his name, uh, the literary um, critic, uh, in, in, in a really nasty way, and just yeah. were bitterly defending this right to do so. Well, as you said, thank you. I mean, to me, that's anti you know, looking at the community to find out uh, the one person who was, has committed a murder or whatever. Yeah. Well, um, I just, I don't know, if, I cited the case of Martin Walzer in order to um, indicate that the, the issue of literary anti-Semitism in Germany appears to be getting much more alive there right now than it may be here. Not that there aren't good examples of literary anti-Semitism in the United States. There are. But for some reason, they, again, they, they have not struck this same kind of chord. And it may be because the Central European case is, as I said, a separate case because of the Shoah. So therefore, Walzer and, and, hit, and the debate surrounding him. And Guntercross. Yeah. Well, and yes. Pearl and, yeah. and a few others. Yeah, but Walzer is really perhaps in a different category. But you're right, you can, one can find others. Um, that, that, seems to me, I mean, that seems to me to be quite significant. But many, in fact, many um, observers have condemned Walzer. They didn't defend, only defend him. So the most 
um, not that much majority. Not, not from the discussions that I have followed. Well, the, there's a fellow in Germany whose name is Matthias Lorenz. And Lorenz wrote a very important book on the Walzer, on the Walzer case, which really, uh, I think it was the best written and the best researched book on Walzer. And he took, he really did not spare any criticism uh, and said, did exactly what I'm asking for. And uh, he was one of the organizers of the conference in Bielefeld, for example, on literary anti-Semitism. And his, even though it was an academic book, its articles were in Die Zeit or in, in, in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeit. In other words, it also reached the broader public, so, so, uh, beyond, let's say, the literary public. So, Lorenz certainly, but there were other, but there were others who took a strong stand against Walter. But also, for instance, Ruth Kluger. Ruth Kluger, you can't say, was writing. I don't know how you want to define her in terms of her. You know, is she Central European? In Vienna, they call her. Our roof, you know, so they try to appropriate her. But she's an American uh, writer of, and a survivor of the, of the Shoah. An old friend of Martin Walser. And an old friend of Martin Walser. Can you summarize Walser issue? What is the issue? There, it's, a, it's, a, it's more than one issue, but there's more there, regarding Walser. is involved in a number of different controversies. That is, the, what interested me about him first was the notion that. Uh, he questioned the problem of for how long do we Germans have to suffer with this burden of the Shoah? Maybe it's time to draw a line and say, that's the past. What happened, it was terrible, it was horrible. And we would say, it was maybe horrible, maybe terrible. But now we have new Germany or a new generation, and it's over. So, but what he is actually saying is, we want Jews to shut up about it. Yeah, Jew, yeah. Okay. Also, yeah. So he's actually yeah. telling Jews he can write. But not only Jews, Jews, not only Jews. Germans sympathetic to this Jew. It sounds like the money. Like to this Jewish uh, way of looking at things. Which is, you know, when you consider that in Western Europe, Germany has the highest rate of anti-Semitism, and no. that sixty no. percent. Uh, um, feel that um, Germany represents the biggest threat to world peace, not to the Middle East, to world peace. Israel. 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 Yeah, I, I um, you know, I'm a little skeptical here. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel, I hear it all the time in, in no. German schools and, uh, and, and in discourse that uh, uh, it's not that uh, we want to find, a, they do have the final line, but what they're implying is you should shut up writing or talking about it. I